Okay, Luke, welcome to the show. For anybody that doesn't know you, isn't aware of your work, could you tell us a bit, a bit about your background and the work that you do, please? Sure, Niall. Um, so my background is uh, as, a, as an entrepreneur throughout my whole 20s. Uh, I left Wall Street. I didn't last very long. Um, was pretty miserable in the world of finance and started four companies in my 20s, um, some successful, some not so successful. And in my late 20s, I had a, a big blown up business deal that caused me to step away for a while and just reflect about what it was I was after. Uh, ended up going back to school, getting degrees in philosophy and theology. Um, and I'm still now very much, I have my, my hats and a lot of, wear a lot of different hats, have my hands in a lot of different things. Um, I teach at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., uh, I run the entrepreneurship program there with my colleague, Andreas Woodmer, and I write. Um, I write a lot. So um, I've been fascinated with business, with um, questions about why people want what they want, uh, starting with myself uh, for a very long time. And uh, I'm in a place right now where I get to invest. I get to start new projects. Um, I get to think about all these questions. So it's, it's really a perfect place for me. Fantastic. There's so much we could get into there. Um, I, and I suppose this is kind of relevant to the conversation, but maybe if you could tell us, Luke, about that transition you made from, you know, you were obviously in San Francisco running the startups and everything, that transition into the studying and, you know, getting more in touch with what you really wanted to do. Sure. Um, so I, um, I had a, a company that I was running at the time called fitfuel.com. It was my fourth company. And I had started it just trying to create a flash valuation, you know, just to blow up the value as quickly as I could and sell it like I'd done with another company before. And it's funny how that works, right? Like the purpose of starting a business is not just to, you know, create the biggest valuation as quick as you can and, and sell it, right? It seems like some, somehow the incentives are a little messed up, right? And I found myself having started a company that I didn't even enjoy running. And I didn't even like half of the products that I sold, yet it consumed my life. I mean, it took 80, 90 hours a week. It was difficult to be in a relationship. So I found myself miserable. And I was like, you know, Luke, it's pretty clear that it doesn't matter. The money is not the thing here. It doesn't matter how much money you make. You're like addicted to something else. Um, like, you know, it's like flipping houses or something like that. Um, and um, it was very much the mentality I was in. So I, I was feeling that tug that I needed to figure out like why I wasn't happy, uh, even as a successful entrepreneur. And when I had this hiccup with the company in 2008, um, when the economy was not so great, and I had a, 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 an acquisition that I was trying to do that, that fell apart at the very last minute, I've, I saw it as kind of a gift to myself uh, to actually just like slow down and, and chill for a little bit and take a vacation take a sabbatical. So that's how it started. It started out with me going to Thailand um, for a couple of weeks, bringing a bunch of nice books with me. When I got back, I enrolled in a class, uh, distance learning program. Uh, and I enrolled at a class called philosophy of the human person. It was recommended to me by a friend, you know, in 2008, they would send me like uh, a three ring binder that had a CD inside of it with a bunch of class notes. And I would just go to the coffee shop at the end of the day. I was still running my company. I would just go to the coffee shop at the end of the day from like 8 to 10 p.m. And I would listen to these lectures. I would study. I would read the assigned reading. And then I was like, man, this is like the best part of my day. <laughs> like, what's, what's wrong with me? Like, I enjoy this way more. So some, I've got to like make some pivot in my life. So I just continued to kind of feed that intellectual desire that I had, right, for, for learning and understanding myself better. And, you know, that eventually led me to just step completely away from that company for a few years. Um, and, you know, I, I eventually sort of came back and very much got back into the, the, the startup world. Um, but having been away for a while and done some serious discernment about my own path, I came back to it with just an entirely sort of different idea about the kind of entrepreneur I wanted to be, the kind of investor that I would want to be, um, the kind of person that I would want to be you know, above all. And, um, you know, it was, it's a transition that not a lot of, um, I guess, entrepreneurs from that world make. Um, so it, it was lonely because I didn't know anybody else that would do it. Everybody thought that I was crazy. Um, but I was like, I, I know that this is something that I need to do, um, in order to 
to truly be confident that how I'm investing my time and my life uh, is going to be something that I'm satisfied with at the end of it. That's, that's really interesting. And I always find it inspiring to speak to somebody that has been on a certain trajectory in life and they've decided to change course because that takes courage. You know, you just, it's just, it's, it's a really hard thing to do for a lot of people. So uh, something I'd like to ask you, look, is that for someone at home that's sitting in that situation, maybe they're not happy with where they're currently at in life. Maybe they're, they've got a certain amount of momentum built up. Um, what advice would you give to them? And I'm also curious to ask before I forget, you, you mentioned you took books with you in that first uh, sabbatical. Were there any that particularly impacted you um, or changed your thinking about things? Um, let's see. Um, one of them was by a guy named Robin Schwarma. And the name of the book was The Saint, The Surfer, and The CEO. And it was this like parable about this, this guy who um, is sort of trying to like find his way in life. And first he sort of, you know, runs into a priest uh, and then he runs into a surfer guy on like the beaches of Hawaii. And then he runs into a, a CEO, a very successful business leader. And it's about these like bits of wisdom that he, he learned from each one of these people. And eventually like he has to put all three of them together in order to kind of like, you know, figure it out. Right. So they all had different pieces of lifestyle advice and life advice. So, you know, that was one of them. Um, I think I took some classic literature along with me too. I can't even remember what at the, at the, at the moment. Brilliant. And then the, the other part of that question was just about, you know, for someone that's in a situation in life where they, where they might not um, be particularly happy, have you got any sort of things you would recommend that they do or? That's right. Yeah. I mean, it does, it takes, you're right. It takes a lot of courage. Um, you know, you just have to ask yourself, like there are certain things in life where it's like, if I don't pa hit pause and figure this out, I'll never know, you know, like if I should have pursued this other thing. Um, and there's, I mean, that's, that's the way that I could describe the way that I felt like if I don't at least test this out, right. If I don't test it, I'll never know. And it might, it might come back to, to really bother me later in life. If I don't at least ex explore this, right. Um, because I don't know what I don't know. Um, so I, I, I would just encourage anybody if you, if you're feeling that kind of like tug and it's persistent and it doesn't go away, um, there may be something that you need to explore in some way. I mean, it might not include you quitting your job and moving across the country or something like that or the world, but it might involve you doing something that is disconcerting, is a little uncomfortable, is a little unnerving. Um, oftentimes, like that's a sign that, you know, maybe that's a step that we have to take. Um, you know, talking, having a good friend or mentor in your life, it was invaluable for me. And, you know, if you don't have one, you know, really try to seek one out. Um, you know, I had those people in my life. Uh, I actually really had one person in my life at that time that was able to encourage me and support me as I stepped away. Otherwise it would have been really lonely. Um, now I have a whole kind of, you know, I, I guess I call on my personal board of directors. I have more than one and it's taken me 10 years to kind of find them. And I don't know what I would do without them. Um, I don't, I don't like calling them a mastermind group. I like calling them like sort of just people who really love and care about me that have a lot of wisdom. Most of them are, all of them are a lot older than me actually. Um, so that, that's also important, right? You, you need to, to be, people sometimes can see things in, in us that we can't see in ourselves. Um, and, and also, you know, I, I can't, I can't, um, ever overestimate the value of taking a break and taking some silence. So that's kind of how it started for me. It was like, I don't know what I need to do, but I, I know that if I, if I just put the pump, the brakes and take at least a week and um, just kind of like unplug from everything, maybe the answer will emerge. And, you know, there's a whole chapter in, in my book sort of dedicated to this idea of investing in silence, right? Like if, if you don't have the answer, you're not sure what to do. One, one sure way to, to gain some clarity is to invest in, in some silence because it just creates distance from, from yourself and from the situation that you're in where we're just too close to see 
to read the signs, right? To, 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 to see the things that we need to see. So by creating that distance, I don't, I don't necessarily mean physical distance. I mean, psychological, spiritual distance, personal distance. Um, we're often able to just get better perspective on where we're at. So that, that's, that would be my one piece of advice. That's, uh, that, those are wise words. A couple of things just to sort of highlight there that I, that I, I noticed you said, um, it seems that you started, this started small for you and it was just, it started small. So it doesn't involve like a huge risk for a start. And the other thing was you noticed, you know, oh, I'm spending 30 minutes a day doing these lectures and it's really lifting me up. So, you know, there was a, there was a bit of self-awareness there and it was starting small. I think those are two important things to keep in mind whenever you're in this kind of situation. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the kind of, um, almost the, the lean startup approach, you know, but to life, right. I, I tell my, my students now, my entrepreneurship students that if they want to, they have this idea of a company they want to start. I always tell them that there's a way to kind of test the idea without spending any money at all. Right. There's always a way to do that. And the same is often true with like life, you know, discernment and decisions, there's almost always some way to, to test out, right. To, to test out the, 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 the way that it would affect you without actually having to do a whole lot, right. Whether that's sort of an imagination exercise, whether it's just to kind of stick one foot in um, and, and you're right. It's just, you can start really, really small and learn incrementally until you get to the point where you're kind of ready to, to make the move. 100%. So really, we're here today, look to talk about your new book, uh, Wanting. Now, in the work that I do, I'm always in the search of uh, new ideas, ideas that I suppose can, you know, help people improve their lives. And uh, for some reason, this book, uh, it's what I think it's one of the most important books I've read the past couple of years, it just it blew my mind. Um, I find it both sort of really interesting, but also terrifying at the same time. It's just like, it was just such an interesting lens through, through, through view, through which to view my own behavior, but also the world around me. And it, mm -hmm. it seemed to explain a lot. Um, so maybe a good place to start, look, if you could tell us um, what is mimetic desire and who was Rene Girard? Sure. Um, I'll start with who was Rene Girard, um, who is the person that, that had this realization about the nature of human desire. Uh, so Rene Girard is a French academic who came to the U.S. shortly after World War II, moved to Indiana, and he taught at a number of universities in the U.S. and ended his career uh, by spending about 15 years at Stanford University in California and was a professor of, um, a formally, it was like he was in the French language and literature uh, department, but he was a true um, polymath, interdisciplinary thinker, like one of the last great, um, really interdisciplinary thinkers of, of, of our times, in my opinion, because he, he was a historian and, and by trade, his PhD was in history, but he read everything. He was interested in absolutely everything from sociology to psychology to classic literature. And he got thrown into teaching literature kind of by accident. You know, he was a young professor. He needed some extra money. And he was asked by the university he was at at the time, Indiana University, to, to teach this course in, in classic European literature. And sometimes when we're not in an industry or in a field, like we can see things that people that are in it can't see because we're coming at it with a fresh pair of eyes. Uh, you know, I, I love the story of like Henry Ford, who walked into a, 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 a slaughterhouse where they were cutting the, the, the pigs up into the component parts. And, you know, he, he saw that with his business eyes. And he was like, that's the assembly line. Why can't I do that for cars? I'll just sort of break, break up the job. So Girard did the same thing. And he believed that the um, that there was truths about human nature that could be found in the text. And he was determined to sort of like find some pattern in the literature that he was reading. Uh, at the time in the late 1950s, when he was doing this, uh, it was sort of in vogue in academia and in, in English and literature to sort of um, 
not view text as interconnected and not not view them as like revealing anything sort of true. It's just these, you know, series of words on a page and, you know, to try to find, you know, some deep truth about human nature would be would be folly. And and he he didn't believe that. Um, he said these are written by humans, so maybe they'll they'll tell us some secret about what it's what it means to be human. And as he read the text, he realized that, and these are these are sort of great novels like Don Quixote, um, Dostoevsky, um, Flaubert, Stendhal, these great French writers, mostly. And he he saw that the characters in the novels didn't desire anything. Uh, totally independently or spontaneously. They didn't just roll out of bed in the morning and want to, you know, pursue a, a woman or a career. Their desires were always uh, influenced and shaped by the other characters in the novel. And in fact, you could even sort of trace their desires very clearly to interactions that they had with the other characters in these books. And he, he said, well, this sort of like blows up this idea, this romantic uh, idea that we have that our desires are entirely our own. Uh, and he said, you know, what I'm seeing is that there's, there's always like a, a, a triangular shape to desire. There's, there's a person and there's a model of desire. And then there's the thing that the model wants. And the person is, is affected by the model and ends up wanting the object, um, based on what the model wants. Uh, and he called this, eventually he called this mimetic desire, which is imitative desire, that all of us have in our lives models of desire that are, that are shaping our own desires, whether we know it or not, um, causing us to sort of gravitate towards certain people or things or careers. And, and it's incredibly powerful. And he spent the rest of his life, I mean, he, he had this realization in, the 19, in 1959, and he spent the rest of his life, he died in 2015, exploring this idea. And he found traces of mimetic desire everywhere from advertising to, you know, to social media, to politics, um, absolutely everywhere. So mimetic is, is just a, a fancy word for imitation. Uh, it comes from the Greek word that simply means to imitate, um, you know, think mimic, mimicry. So mimic desire, imitative desire, mimetic desire was his, his one big idea. And the rest of his work kind of flows from that. It's so interesting. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, I didn't see it mentioned in the book, but have you thought much about why this might have evolved in humans? Like what would there be, have been an adaptive purpose to mimetic desire? Hmm. Well, there's a whole um, body of um, of work called the generative anthropology, uh, and it's very closely related to Rene Girard's work. And there, there is a theory um, about this um, that you know that humans, as we know them, kind of evolved around the moment when we developed. Um, uh, we developed in, we developed our sort of imitative abilities, like something happened and we're not, we're not quite sure why that allowed us to, um, it's what allowed us to basically build culture, right? Because to, to build, to build culture, like we need to be able to imitate more than just, um, external things, right? Like, cause animals have those powers of imitation, like the monkey see monkey do. Like they can imitate you eating something or, or, or making a motion. Um, so we have to be able to imitate more than external actions and features. We have to somehow be able to imitate abstract things. I mean, it's, it's how we have language. Like if we weren't able to imitate, we would never be able to learn language. So we're, we're able to read beneath the surface level of things and imitate really abstract desires of, of other people and things that are basically the foundation of culture. So that, that would be, you know, really it's, it's, so it's, it's foundational to what it means to be human is what I would say that there, we, we have this ability. Mimetic desire is uniquely human because animals don't desire in the way that we do. Right. I mean, I, I feed my dog and he's totally happy. He lays down and goes to sleep. 
right? Um, if I have like a perfect meal, I'm like, okay, like what now? Like, what do I want now? Right? I, like we, we have these desires that seem basically infinite. Um, you know, where do they come from? So that's, that's the, if, if anybody listening is interested in learning more, um, there's a whole section in Gerard's book called Things Hidden from the Foundation of the World dedicated to the process of homonization um, and sort of the, the, w- when we became, you know, human and mimetic desire is, is clearly a core part of that. Cool. Cool. Um, so one of the things you mentioned in the book is just about how deep this actually goes in human nature. And you, you, you tell a story of, I think it's Andrew Meltzoff and the experiments he does with newborn kids. Maybe if you could tell us a bit more about that, just how quickly this, this develops in humans. Yeah. So Dr. Andrew Metzoff uh, at the University of Washington, he's one of the world's leading researchers in um, neuroscience, but particularly in children and childhood development. So he studies babies and toddlers, children for a living. Um, one of his most famous experiments is going into a hospital with uh, newborns who are, you know, less than an hour old. And, you know, he would stick out their tongue at them and they would stick out their tongue, you know, back at him. So already from the minute they, they've emerged from the womb, they're able to imitate facial gestures. Interestingly enough, he's found that they only imitate their fellow humans. They, they, they won't do this with um, any, anything else, right? Like a video, um, it's gotta be a, a, a living person, right? They, they somehow know that, oh, this person is the same as me. Mm-hmm. This person is the same creature as me. And they started imitating humans. Um, and then he ran a, a whole series of experiments to try to find out kind of how deep the, the imitation or the mimesis goes. Uh, one of the experiments he ran was um, seeing if, if babies, if toddlers could imitate uh, the intentions of others. So he put some adults in a room with the toddlers and he had them uh, do a little experiment. So they, they pretended as if they wanted to pull the ends off of a little toy dumbbell. So imagine like an, uh, um, you know, a little sort of um, soft toy dumbbell and they would try to pull the ends off of it. And then they would intentionally, you know, fail and be like, ah, I, I can't get it. And then they would just give up. And as soon as they left the room, the babies, of course, picked up the dumbbells and pulled the ends right off. They knew exactly what the adults wanted to do. Now that might seem like a, like, well, obviously they did, right? Like, but it's not that obvious, right? Because I mean, if they were just imitating the adults, they, they, they wouldn't know what the adults wanted. They did, they imitated what they knew the adult wanted to do and not what the adult actually did. So, and that's just one of many experiments that he's done that are, that's showing um, that these children have an amazing power to read the intentions of adults. Like, it's crazy. Like, never... You know, children are just, they, they, they have like an intuition that they don't really understand, um, but they're developing it like from the moment that they, they leave the womb. They're paying attention to absolutely everything. They also do gaze following. So, you know, most of our first models are our parents and babies learn how to follow the gaze of their mother um, right away. So if the, if the mom is looking at something, the baby takes an interest in that object because the mom is looking at it. Otherwise they wouldn't have an interest in it. So already that's, that's a model of desire from the very beginning. And then as we grow older, we just develop more and more sophisticated ways to read um, what other people are interested in, what other people want, even when um, they try to disguise what they want. Cause much of adult life is, like disguising our true desires or, you know, um, you know, we don't want to come on like we want something too much, you know, often. Um, but we all secretly have this very deep hardwired ability to intuit uh, what it is that other people desire and then it affects what we desire to. 100%. Um, so for somebody at home listening to this um, and they're thinking, this is really interesting, but, you know, how is this kind of relevant to to my life. So my next question, Luke, is why is this important for people to understand and how you can understanding mimetic theory improve somebody's life? Mm. The, the simplest thing is, is for me, I mean, my, the reason that this was important to me was on a very personal existential level. 
um, knowing that desire is mimetic and that, you know, people want things based on what models want, um, was important looking back in my own life and understanding the forces that had shaped some of the things that I had placed a really high value on from a young age. Um, you know, why I wanted to, um, move to New York city, why I wanted to transfer from one school to the other school, why I wanted to work on wall street in the first place, um, is kind of an odd thing. I just took it for granted. Like, Oh, this is, you know, this is the job that pays the most money, but it's not, it's not obvious why I would desire that job so much or why I wanted to, you know, start my first company in a certain industry. Um, I'd went through my life convincing myself of all of these hyper rational reasons why I wanted to do certain things. But when I was honest with myself and when I looked back, I was able to find very powerful models, like pretty much every step of the way. And I had just accepted at face value that these desires were all my own, not having seen these hidden models that were in my life. And when I developed that awareness, um, I was able to see what was really driving me. And part of an important component of mimetic desire is, I mean, there's mimetic desire is not good or bad. It's just neutral. It's just, it is the way that we are. We're social creatures. We care about what other people want. It affects what we want. It's neutral. But if we're not aware of it, it can very often, in fact, usually is pretty destructive, or at least will make us relatively miserable because we become fixated on, on what other people want. And um, mimetic desire, Gerard would say, is basically the driving force behind negative rivalry and, and negative forms of competition in, in the world. Uh, competition is not a bad thing, but it can be bad when it's just stupid competition and when it's just stupid rivalry. That's like a zero sum game and nobody has anything to, to gain from it. Um, and we like forget what we wanted in the first place because we become obsessed with what somebody else wants and um, we forget how much they're driving our, our own desire. Um, you know, and I think, you know, we, we see this in the world, certainly in the US, like in our political environment, it's like what each side wants to do just becomes an obsession with the other side. Um, you know, within companies, mimetic desire often shapes like the little totems that people, you know, desperately seek um, in terms of like, you know, little affirmations and awards and, and status seeking things that might have nothing to do with the actual, you know, health of the company. Um, you know, it can, it can often lead us to, to do things um, that we don't really deeply des desire. Um, you know, we've never probably even thought about why we desire them. So I think th this is a long, it's been a long journey for me and just developing a greater awareness for the, the forces that are shaping my desires. And it helps with my decision-making. Um, you know, just in the last month, I've had some, you know, some big choices that I've had to make, um, you know, opportunities that have come my way. And I'm able to sort of question my motivations and ask myself, well, why do I really like want, want this thing? Is this has more to do with like my pride or is this, is it, is it because this other person like, you know, uh, wants it as well and, and it's valuable to them. And, and, you know, if I get the thing, then do I feel some sense of superiority or something like that? And there's this constant process of, of refinement that ultimately just makes us happier people um, because we're not going from one thing to the next, just unaware of, of what it is that's, that's, that's really important to us. It, it makes a lot of sense. And when you really think about it, you know, your desire, your desires are at the root of almost all of your behaviors, almost everything you do in life, everything you pursue is shaped by what you want, what you desire. And if you're not aware of the forces that are underneath that or that are shaping that, like you can just be so easily led down so many wrong paths and just get yourself into so, so much hassle that you could have avoided in the first place if you were aware of this force, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, it, social media is, is, is presents millions of models to us every day. Um, and, you know, one of the exercises I do with my students, for instance, is, you know, we'll, we'll scroll through social media, uh, we'll watch advertisements, uh, you know, commercials, and 
I, I, I like them to actually like pay attention to what's happening uh, interiorly as, as they're doing that, like how it's actually affecting their desires. Very, very few people have the level of interiority um, or awareness of what's going on inside them as they're, as they're just exposed to these different forces. So it's almost, you know, a, a habit. It's a skill that, that it's possible to develop when, you know, when we see, you know, it's almost like, you know, you can, you can feel a little tug on the front of the shirt um, when you, when you're exposed to certain things and you sort of develop a level of awareness where you can catch yourself going down a path um, at, you know, at step one, rather than step five, six, seven, eight, or nine, or something like that. hundred percent. And it's, it's as well, another point you make in the book, I think is very important that it's, it's inescapable. Everybody has models, you know? I, um, and I think another thing to say is that it's easy for us to be aware of who other people's models are, but less easy for us to sort of think um, about our own models, you know, and even someone like Steve Jobs, you talk about it, like this guy seems like he doesn't have a care in the world. Like he's so original. He had models too, like, you know, so. Our powerful models. I mean, he, one of his fellow students at Reed College, um, he basically idolized this guy. And, you know, some of Steve Jobs' um, colleagues later, later in life um, were sort of trying to trace a lot of Steve Jobs' personality um, back, back to something like how, what sort of what made him like this, right? And sometimes in, in, in our society, we just have this like, well, they're just like born that way or something. And sure, like we, we are like we, we are we have, we're born with like different dispositions and, and part of our personality is that way. But a large part of it is shaped right by, by influence and in, in, in other people in our lives. And some of his colleagues started to realize that there was this one particular guy. Um, this is in um, Walter Isaacson's excellent biography of Steve Jobs. That's where I first heard that story. Um, Daniel, um, uh, I, forget, I forget his last name, Kopke, I think, um, was just this powerful figure in, in Jobs' life that um, really ended up um, giving him what, what his friends call this reality distortion field. Because this other guy had this reality distortion field. He just do these crazy things. And Jobs was never quite like that until he met this particular guy. So, you know, if it's, it's fascinating to kind of like look back in our life and see the way that different people have shaped us, but not even just people, right? Like different things that we've consumed. Uh, one of my very good friends watched this movie called A Few Good Men, like 25 years ago. Um, really popular movie, at least here in the States, with Jack Nicholson. Uh, and my friend watched the same movie uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And he said, you know, Luke, I, I, I was thinking about like mimesis as I rewatched the movie, because some of the phrases that I use and some of the mannerisms and things that I have, like they came from that movie. And I, I, when I rewatched the movie, I realized like that's where I learned that phrase. Couldn't have been from anywhere else. He goes, but I didn't even know it at the time. I've, I never would have known it unless I rewatched the movie. Um, and I thought that was kind of a cool example of like something, you know, being made aware of something that, that influenced him uh, a long time ago that he's just carried with him this whole time. I mean, it's a little thing, but it was an important realization for him. 100%. I just, you just reminded me of uh, my, my older brother. Um, we had an, we had an older cousin still and he had a bad injury. So he was walking around for a year with like a funny kind of limp. And wouldn't, you know, my older brother sort of mimicked this limp for a, for a good few weeks until we started saying to him, you know, why are you walking there? Are you just copying, copying this guy? But um, what I'd like to ask you about uh, now, look, is um, the, in the in the book you talk about um a lot of examples from history and i think one of the most interesting ones was the example of the pharmacos in uh, ancient greece and this the scapegoat mechanism so maybe if you could tell us a bit more about that there and how that uh how that works sure so the word that the, the english word pharmacy comes from a greek word pharmakos which um, basically means um, the disease and the cure or the disease that became the cure. Uh, interesting that that's what we call a pharmacy uh, in, in the modern world. So and I, why it's interesting, I'll be about to tell you, because the, the pharmacos played a very specific ritual function in ancient Greece and other cultures had their own version of the pharmacos 
um, that worked in the, in the exact same way. So the pharmacos was a person in the, in the town, in the society who was singled out for some reason, usually when there was some um, calamity, a plague, something had went wrong. Um, <clears throat> people wanted to find a, a, a reason for, for this. They wanted to, they wanted to find somebody to blame. Um, you know, they were very superstitious. Um, you know, often there was sort of mythologies that, you know, certain people were demons or, you know, they, they, because of their presence, they had sort of introduced some kind of a, um, you know, contagious illness into the to town, even like with actual physical diseases, they would, they would just um, fi find somebody to blame it on basically, but even, even social problems. Like if, if there was just a lot of tension, you know, they would make up a story that this person called the pharmacos um, is, you know, is a witch or, you know, for whatever, for whatever, they would just make up some reason that this person was to blame, um, you know, or they had committed a taboo, right? This is the, the case with Oedipus, right? He had committed incest. So, you know, th therefore, you know, he had caused this, this plague in Thebes, right? So this was very common in ancient Greece. And the pharmacos was typically somebody that was marginalized, somebody that couldn't defend themselves. And the, the consensus very quickly formed um, that they were the person to blame. So it was all against one. Mm -hmm. And the pharmacos, once they were chosen, they, were, um, they underwent sort of a, a ritual um, process. I mean, this is horrible, okay, terrifying. But they would, in many cases, they would they would parade the pharmacos in the middle of town. All of the people would throw things at him or her. Very often, women um, throw things at them. Um, they would flog them. Um, they would do all kinds of horrible thing, horrible things, spit on them, and eventually, um, eventually kill them. And one of the most common ways uh, to kill a pharma up to uh, the at the very edge of a cliff. And all of the people would essentially just crowd against them so that the pharmacos, you know, his back was, was against the edge of the cliff. Uh, and they would eventually just um, crowd, crowd them until they had no choice but to fall off of the cliff or, or push them off the cliff. Um, if anybody has watched the movie Midsummer, the, the, the horror uh, film Midsummer, this exact thing happens in that, in that film. Um, this is a recent movie. It came out a couple of years ago. And there's no way that the, whoever wrote it um, wasn't familiar with this, uh, this idea of the pharmacos from ancient Greece. Um, other times they, they would stone the pharmacos. Um, they would find all kinds of really terrible ways to, to kill them. But the cliff, the, the backing off the cliff was, was an important part of that. So the, the pharmacos brought healing to the community, um, some kind of false psychological healing um, and catharsis. So, you know, one of the reasons why they went through this ritual and they would beat and flog and spit on the pharmacos is that it made the people feel good. I mean, it, it, it was a ritual process through which they felt like they were, they were taking out uh, their problems on the source of the problem. Now, of course, mm -hmm. the pharmacos was always innocent, but, you know, it actually did result in some psychological healing or transference onto the pharmacos who obviously had to pay, you know, the ultimate price for this. And then once they were killed, there was a sense of return to normalcy because by, by uniting against the pharmacos, uh, whatever tensions that they had in the community, blaming each other, right. For everything. Now they had just one person. So, and, and they collectively participated in this act against the pharmacos. So it, it actually had a unifying role. It like brought the people together. It made them feel good. It made them feel like they were in solidarity. Ah, now we were against each other. Now we're together because we found the cause of the problem. And, you know, the, the, the healing was not real, but it, it felt, it felt real to them. And of course, you know, pretty soon they would have to find another pharmacos because, right? yeah. because, because this is just, it's just a ritual. Um, and, you know, I, I would argue, you know, that, that we've continued to do that in, in various forms throughout history. Um, you know, there's, there's a, the, an ancient Jewish ritual on Yom Kippur where, you know, a goat is driven out into the wilderness after the, all of the sins of the people are laid on the goat. Um, and there've just been, you know, case after case of this, right? The witch trials. Um, pharmacos is just the Greek word for it. Um, you know, another word would be scapegoat. 
Um, and you know, we, we continue to find scapegoats in, in our world and they, they provide the same kind of function for us as a society. And, um, you know, it's be, being aware that that's something that we do is really important. And you might be asking like, what does this have to do with, with mimetic desire? Um, well, it works because of mimetic desire, you know, like that, that process of, of unification of everybody wanting to transfer the blame onto the same person, that process is, is able to happen through mimesis, through imitation, mimetic desire. And it spreads like contagion throughout uh, a town, throughout a country, throughout an organization. It's amazing when somebody has been singled out, how fast the accusations can come and how quickly the consensus can form that the person is responsible. And that I would argue is a product of mimesis. That's so interesting. Um, so a, a big thing, a big topic in the book, Luke, is about uh, competition. And you uh, differentiate between two types of competition. One that happens in something called uh, Celebristan and Freshmanistan. Can you tell us a bit more about that there and why, why that's important? Mm. So this comes from Rene Girard himself, who said that there are two kinds of models, uh, two major kinds of models of desire. The first kind is a model that is outside of our world. Um, you know, we don't have any possibility of coming into contact with this model of desire. So this could be, you know, when I was a kid, Michael Jordan was a model of desire for me. Like I wanted to be a professional basketball player. I'm only five, nine, it never happened. Uh, and I don't have that great of a shot. Um, and you know, if Michael Jordan wanted to wear a certain kind of shoe, then so did I. So he was an external model of desire for me. There's no possibility really of me ever, you know, competing against Jordan, right? Or, or becoming a rival to him. So Gerard calls those external models of desire because they're external to our world. Um, I, I give them the name Celebristan, that they live in Celebristan. And because Celebristan is the world of, of, of celebrities or people that I don't have a serious possibility of becoming rivals with. The other kind of model is the kind that's inside of our world. Um, and I say that they, they live in freshmanistan because for me, um, being a freshman in, in my high school and at my university um, is emblematic of, of, of this kind of a model because we're all, we're all in the same space. We're all this roughly the same age. Um, you know, we're all more or less kind of concerned about the same things in that kind of environment. And any of us can sort of become a rival to any of the others, um, you know, be because of the, the degree of, of proximity that we have, not just uh, physical proximity, um, but social and sort of existential proximity, you know, we're just more alike. And Gerard calls these internal mediators or internal models of desire and they're more dangerous because like michael jordan and i had no possibility of of, of getting in like some kind of a toxic feud right <laughs> um if anything that could be positive right he could inspire me to to become a better player or or inspire me to to to, to be a better competitor or whatever or you know to work that hard in or in whatever i do the the other kind of model, though, the kind that I say are in Freshmanistan, are the kind that we have to be careful about because we can enter into kind of a, um, a dance with them, a, a dance of desire. Um, they're close to me. I interact with these people, and they're the, they're the people that I least want to admit are models of desire for me, too. Like, it's easy to, for me to admit that, like, a, some great celebrity or Michael Jordan is, is, is influences me. It's not that easy for me to admit that my colleague influences what I want <laughs> really hard, right? Like, Oh, Luke, like, why did you buy like a, a new Tesla? Well, you know, it's because you like Tom, you know, in the other office over got one and it would made me feel like I was keeping up with him. Nobody says that, right? Nobody says that but it's, it's very often driving us and, and affecting our motivations. And we, we give ourselves other reasons why we adopt those desires. Um, so this, this kind of internal mediator of desire is the kind that I spend most of my time focusing on in the book, because I think um, our world is becoming more and more dominated by internal mediators of desire. I think social media 
has made us all in some sense, internal mediators of desire to one another, because even people that used to be celebrities, like being a celebrity used to be different 20 years ago. Um, You know, I didn't have the possibility to like reply to their tweets and to, to actually interact with them. And sometimes they even interact back. That's like walking the edge between Celebristan and Freshmanistan, right? It's kind of a little funny gray area, but it's different than it used to be. And, you know, I think we have to think seriously about mimesis in a world in which um, we're all a little bit closer together, existentially speaking, than, than we used to be, or at least we have access or we see so many more models of desire. We're going to have to really develop, um, you know, kind of something in our guts uh, to, to help us not let that kind of like take us in a million different directions. A hundred percent. And one of the things you talk about in the book is um, creating boundaries with unhealthy models. And the second, the second part of the book is, you know, it's all around becoming anti-memetic and being able to just improve your relationship with desire, because it seems that it's not, not something that you can ever really fully escape, but you can improve how you, how you relate to it. So maybe now it'd be a good idea to start talking about some of these, some of these tactics. Um, one that I, f- I found really interesting and sort of, I, I don't think I'd heard it before your book, was this idea of g- g- first getting clear on your values, but then the importance of ranking these values, like having a hierarchy of values. Could you maybe tell us why, why that's important? Sure. Um, I'll use the uh, business example, but this applies to our lives. Um, it's even more important in our, in our personal lives. Um, You know, a lot of companies has become very popular, especially over the last 20 years to have, you know, core values and, you know, what's your mission? What are the values? And most organizations can just rattle off eight, nine, 10, 10 values, right? Oh, we value honesty. We value this and that. Um, But that, that creates a little bit of a problem because um, oftentimes, well, first of all, often it's just paying lip service to these things and most places don't actually like concretely um, have ways to, to like live them out and like measure how well they're being lived out. Um, but the other thing is just sort of like the, the ones that become most important at any given time are just the ones that are most expedient or the ones that are sort of most mimetically, mimetically valued in a given situation. So without a hierarchy of values, without knowing how they relate to, to one another, you're going to run into problems. And like, here's a classic example. Um, you know, we're running into this problem. Well, let me give you the business example first, then I'll give you the life example. So classic example, a company says that they value um, diversity and they value, um, you know, long-term, long-term uh, experience and, and trust and relationships. So what happens when you have uh, like a, a, an industry um, I don't know, tractor sales, you know, in the, in the U S here, where you have like a bunch of like old dudes who have built up, you know, 30 years of, of relationships and trust with the people that they sell to. Um, but you also value diversity at the same time. Um, how do those, how do those two values relate? Are they, are you put equal weight on them? Like, how do you think about them? Right? Like, so without, without understanding that, without understanding like how values fit together, what the hierarchy is, what's more important, you always end up running into problems, right? Um, there's, because everything's, if everything's the same, then, then nothing's important. It's like highlighting every word in a book, well, what's actually important in any given context. And I think the, the more I mean, kind of the situation that we're all living in now is, is we're dealing with this with COVID, with the pandemic. Like, you know, everybody has a different idea of what's more valuable. Um, you know, like here in the U S you typically can't visit a loved one if, 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 you know, if they're in the hospital and they have COVID, even if they're dying. Right. And, you know, there's just large disagreement. Like, is it more valuable to be able to do that? Or is it more valuable to, to reduce the risk? And everybody's sort of, you know, making their own calculations and has their own ideas. We don't have a shared hierarchy of values. Right. So, and and in our personal lives, this also affects us, right? Like, let's say that I, you know, I, I value, um, I value my, um, uh, I value my friends 
wedding. Um, and I also value being with my family at Easter. Okay. And then he decides to hold his bachelor party in Vegas on, uh, on good Friday, right. Two days before Easter. And I'm like, well, I, I said that these are both values of mine. Like which one is more important to me? Right. Um, if I don't have, if I'm not clear about that, then I'm just going to have a really hard time making a decision. Oh my gosh, what do I do? I don't want to disappoint him. I don't want to disappoint my family, but my values on that are very clear. Like as much as I love my friend, I'm going to be with my family for those three days. Right. Um, cause that's just clear for me. And I try to have a hierarchy of values in, in every area of my life. It's important in business. It's important in a family, right. For, for children to know, um, what that, what that relationship is and, you know, mind change. Um, but I, you know, I think it's actually like helpful to kind of like visualize this and to, to start mapping it out for yourself. Um, it's the only way to kind of get clear on, on where things fall. A hundred percent. And you also talk about the importance of sort of having one core desire, like one core desire. And it's okay to have that. And then the idea of that is that you can subordinate all other kind of desires to that one, that one big thing that you're, you're going after. Could you maybe expand on that, on that a bit? Yeah. So I, you know, I talk about this idea of, 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 of a single greatest desire and when I sort of use that phrase, I, what I have in mind is, is really a vocation, um, you know, like some purpose for our lives, something that we really feel called to do. Um, and, you know, our awareness of that often changes, you know, we, we, we get greater and greater awareness as we go through life, right? Um, I'm still figuring out more, more what mine is, right? Every day, every year. Um, but, and that's okay, right? If it changes, but it is sort of important to sort of understand, like, this has to do with the hierarchy of values, right? There's also like the hierarchy of desires. It's the same concept. Um, you know, which desire of mine, like right now, is, is my single greatest desire. And so, you know, let's say, you know, for me, um, it's, it's really to, to just love my family. I'm recently married. It's, it's to love my wife, my family. Um, to take care of my parents right now, I'm I'm feeling like this is this this is this is my single greatest desire in in my life is to really develop these just beautiful strong relationships at this point in my life. Well, then all of all of my other desires sort of are 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 understood in the context of that single greatest desire. So, if I get a job opportunity on the other side of the country like the way that I evaluate that is like, well, how does that help me like achieve my single greatest desire? Well, that would move me like way away from my parents who are, are very old now. And I'm trying to spend as much time with them as I can. Right. That's my, that's the greater desire. So it's, it acts as a hermeneutic almost like a, a way to interpret all of my other desires in the, in the light of this. And they either, they either feed it or they, or they take away from it. And it's how I understand sort of like vocation um, and, and priorities. What do I want to invest in? And it, it sort of makes um, mimetic desire a little bit easier to, to, to navigate. Like when you have some idea of, of your single greatest desire, um, puts everything into context. And if you don't know what your single greatest desire is, um, then that's that the kind of that's the first step then is to, to spend some time seriously trying to discern um, what it is that you mo that you most deeply, deeply de desire um, when you cut away all the BS, right? Like what what is it that ten years from now um, you will you will look back on your, the decade and feel really satisfied that you spent it pursuing um, that desire, like the kind of desire that you, you're sure will never disappoint you. Hundred percent wise words. Um, so. The other thing to, to mention here as well is you talk about um, or you recommend going and staring at a tree for, I think it's an hour, at least an hour. Is that right? At least an hour, yeah. Why would you recommend someone do that? Um, because uh, one of my favorite books um, is a book by Ian McGilchrist called The Master and His Emissary. And um, I first read that book many years ago, and it's influenced me deeply. And I've realized how true it is. He talks about sort of two brains or two parts of the brain. Uh, one of them is, is a sort of the calculating sort of um, very analytical part of the brain. And 
it, it, it's how we exercise um, calculating thought. The other part of the brain, um, the other kind of system is for more meditative thought. It's sort of like where we just, we take in um, new things. We notice where we're attentive. Um, and then that ends up going to the analytical part of the brain. Um, but it, you know, he basically makes the very strong case that, that, that calculating part of the brain has like, um, really like blown up and to, to the detriment of the meditative part of our brain. Like we just live in a kind of culture where everything is very analytical. Um, it, it'd be like, you know, it's like a, um, hypertrophy of, of, of the calculating side of the brain. It would be like, if we have, you know, we have two biceps and we like only ever do curls with one bicep for 10 years and it's just massive. And the other one we've met, we can't even pick up a five pound weight. Like that's the way that I would sort of describe this. And we have to like bring that back into balance. So in, in my life, those kind of like giving, forcing myself to do things that, that exercise the meditative part of my mind uh, has been really important at helping bring that back into balance. So things like um, staring at a tree for an hour, you know, you can't calculate anything with the tree. I mean, you just, it's just really hard to do that. Even if you wanted to, you just have to kind of be, you know, attentive to it. Uh, one of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver sort of said, you know, attentiveness is kind of like the, the first step of prayer, you know? So um, if you don't stare at a tree, you stare, like sit in a room alone, like Blaise Pascal said, all of humanity's problems stem from our inability to sit alone in a room because we, you know, we've, we've lost the ability to do that. So we're constantly trying to entertain ourselves with things. And I, I just have a firm belief that gaining the ability to sit still. And I, I think I have a particular struggle with this. I'm like a go, go, go personality. So I've had to treat these kinds of exercises like as seriously as I treat going to the gym. And wow. they, 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 they may even be more important and I don't do an hour a day, <laughs> but I definitely, you know, I sit with my morning coffee for 10 minutes and, and engage in this kind of reflective activity, because if I don't do that, what am I going to do? I'm going to roll out of bed and I will be in front of this computer within 60 seconds because I have no shortage of work and I have to create those boundaries so that I don't just go into the default mode. And I found for almost everybody that I know, our default mode is to exercise that calculating highly analytical part of the brain. 100%, 100%. Well, look, um, I think that's all we've got time for. Um, where can people find you online? Where can people find the book? Have you got any sort of um, request you'd like to make to people? Any any parting advice you'd like to offer before before we end the end the show? Sure. Um, well, you could find me at, at lukeburgess.com. And I, I write a Substack newsletter uh, at least once a week. I'm actually going to be moving it up to twice a week. So all of these, um, mimetic theory is a huge topic. Uh, and all of the things that I just wasn't able to fit in the book, um, I write about in my, in my newsletter, which is called anti-mimetic. And it's kind of documenting my own journey to, to live in a healthy way in a, in a highly mimetic world and try to be anti-mimetic where, where I need to be. And, um, and a little community is forming there of people that are sort of seeing the mimesis in their own lives and on this process of discovery and, and discernment and, and figuring out purpose. So um, please, you know, consider joining me there and, uh, you know, parting words. Um, well, this has just been a pleasure. So thank you for having me on. And, um, you know, I would say that in the process of writing this book and since having learned of Rene Girard, I've sort of discovered this awesome, awesome responsibility that I have, um, in some ways, as a um, as someone who understands how mimetic I am, and that I'm affected by what other people want, and in turn, I affect what other people want. Right? I'm a teacher. Um, I have 18, 19 year old students that that look to me as a model. Um, you know, I have I have some friends. I know that I affect their desires, and they affect mine. Um, so living with this awareness of this awesome responsibility that we have in some small way, we do affect one another's desires, um, has just been a, a tremendous realization for me and has changed the way that I live my life. So um, I would encourage any listeners to think, think seriously about that and uh, join me on the journey of, of, of trying to, to want uh, in a way that, that makes our, our, our world a better place to be in. That's actually one of the sentences I, I, I highlighted from the book. It was... In the final analysis, two things are going to matter. The first one is, what did you want? 
And the second one is, what did you help other people to want? You know, and I, I think you're right. That's a very, I think that can be a, a very inspirational thing to, to, to realize that you can help shape the desires of other people and in turn influence culture in that way and, and change things for the better just by your example, you know? So that's a, it's a really important point, I think. Thanks, Niall. Um, so look, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I wish you the best of luck with everything going forward. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it.